least up to now, um, most of the talks and discussion, in a way, has kind of centered around uh, the assumption that the way in which the architectural past gets into the school of design is via teaching. Um, and that may indeed uh, be an important route. But in a way, it's not the only uh, route. And I want us to, to really think uh, that there are other kind of media, other vehicles through which that past is available, even if up until recently they haven't been uh, clearly exploited. And this kind of moves us to the next talk, um, where I'm very pleased that we have Irene Sun Wu, who is uh, researching into the archives and the history of the AA itself, because uh, obviously one way in which perhaps people can become interested in architectural history as a broader field is through a concern with the institution of which they're a part. Irene is, is still writing this as a, uh, a doctorate um, at Princeton, where she's established herself as a thoroughly independent uh, PhD student. Um, before that, she was here as a, a very gifted student in the MA in the histories and uh, theories. She's a very active sort of curator and writer, and, uh, and we're extremely pleased that she was able to come here today, Irene. And then she'll also join us for the d discussion uh, afterwards. So, Irene. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and the invitation to speak uh, today. And I am very much a student, as Mark pointed out. Uh, I'm writing my doctoral thesis. Um, to be more specific, it's uh, tracing the development of Alvin Boyarsky's pedagogical theories and projects. And of course, his most well-known project is the AA, where he was chairman between 71 and 1990. But what I'm trying to do is not exactly an institutional history, nor is it a straightforward biography, but rather tracing the ways that pedagogy becomes a primary agent within architectural culture. And now given the subject of this conference, the teaching of architecture's past, it perhaps might have been more fitting for me to talk about the first chapter of the thesis, which deals with the development of Boyarsky's um, education and modernism, which developed, I argue, in tandem with his own teaching methodology, in particular his use of slide projectors when talking about the history of urbanism and more specifically Chicago. Um, but instead, today I'm presenting a more recent part of the project, uh, which is on the uses of media at the AA in the 1970s. Um, and in this way, I feel that this opportunity is very much a luxury for me, having you as my audience and critics. Um, certainly, the objects, images, and characters that I'm going to be talking about and um, will show on the screen will be familiar to many of you, so much so that perhaps they seem particularly mundane at first glance. Um, and in many ways, many of you have grown up with these images and people. But I hope to reintroduce you to them here in an unfamiliar way and thus set up a transition into our panel discussion about the archive. Um, and just, just a few final thank yous. I'd like to say thank you to Henderson Downing for being um, such a wonderful video archivist and really helping me through the many summers that I've come to the AA, um, digging through the videos in boxes and in corners of closets and whatnot, um, as well as Dennis Crompton, um, who's been an especially great resource for me. And also, finally, as always, to Nicholas Boyarsky and Nicola Murphy for being such wonderful hosts in London. So I'd like to begin with a brief clip from a video, one which I know has been played and displayed here in the school in different contexts, and which I hear knowingly invoke as a repeat performance. So this is a just very short. Yeah. 
I use magazines very greedily, um, primarily in order to achieve economy in time. And I think that the usefulness of a magazine should uh, be in continuously recorded by oneself. I write notes on magazines, even if I mean to throw them away after a short time. I also do a lot of tearing out of articles and filing. Um, I think one should avoid too many magazines, and the ones that I'm discussing this morning are the ones that I read or look at regularly, without exception. That is not just the ones that um, I use in the office. I'm not talking about any magazines uh, which I think bad or don't look at, because that would be uh, negation of the point I made earlier about economy of time. I'm not particularly interested in other architects' views about architecture. Uh, this may be a, sh a shortcoming. I'm not particularly interested in looking at detailed architectural photographs or indeed plans of, of chosen beautiful buildings. I'd rather see a third-rate building being built than a first-rate one in the pages of magazines. And this, I think, will come out in the magazines I show. So we have just encountered Cedric Price in an episode of Archimags, a program staged and recorded at the AA in London in the spring of 75, and broadcast on TV AA, the school's closed-circuit television station. Commenting on the quality of illustrations and content, as well as the talents of editors, Price continues to divulge his reading habits from behind a table strewn with a selection of magazines, from architectural design to offshore engineer, from country life, which he tells us he buys for his mother, to the Journal of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Indeed, as he's keen to note, not only does he receive a number of publications free by virtue of being a member of certain institutions, but the magazines themselves were often the sole reason for his membership. For in their delivery of information, they often outperformed the activities of their host institution, a mediatic eclipse that paralleled his preference for photographs of architectural process over built work. Yet as this episode of Archimex progresses, a further economy of both architecture and media becomes apparent. For television frames and architectural discourse on print, and a McLuhan-esque cross-fertilization as one medium becomes the content of another. Moreover, this conflation of the page and the screen unfolds through a didactic performance that is not only staged within, but that is also constituted by a broader framework of architectural education. Television then provides but one lens for interrogating a cross-fertilization of pedagogy, architecture, and media practices at the AA during the 1970s in turn revealing itself as part of an institutional matrix that is itself intrinsically spectacular. For although the historical objects that this paper addresses take the form of audiovisual tools from television and video to newspapers and other printed media, rather than position such modes of production as indicative of a media explosion at the AA, I would like to suggest instead that the school's internalization of such practices point to an implosion of both media and architectural education one whose ensuing distortions make legible the very limits of the institution. Now, we take an intermission from TVAA, an interlude that will traverse a varied terrain of media, beginning with the photograph of the Canadian-born Boyarsky, chairman of the AA from 1971 to 1990, and seen here in his office at the school, a figure and an image familiar to most of you, but which here presents a composition that, to be sure, echoes the televised image of Price. On the one hand, while Price is seated behind a table littered with his selection of magazines, we find Boyarsky at the AA, his desk overflowing with paperwork, presiding over an edu educational model that he described as a well-laid table, an array of divergent architectural positions provided by a coterie of tutors and visiting architects, historians, and theorists, some of whom we'll meet momentarily. This is a continually updated collection of people and ideas that is here further evoked by the multiple telephones on his desk, just some of the critical tools of our institutional impresario, but is also a collection that resonates with Price's spread of periodicals, each culled for their individual qualities, yet each also participating in a cyclical process of renewal. 
So to tackle this dual notion of renewal inherent in both media and pedagogy, we must first consider Boyarsky's own dual training as educator and host. For indeed, like Price, Boyarsky is entirely conscious of an audience, impishly welcoming our intrusion into his office, which appears like a stage set dramatically flanked by busts of Wren and Inigo Jones, and filled with other props, including slide boxes, postcards, and plans of Gothic cathedrals hanging on the wall. Certainly by the time he began his chairmanship in 1971, he was no stranger to the camera's eye. As professor and associate dean of the College of Architecture and Art at the newly inaugurated Chicago Circle campus of the University of Illinois, during the second half of the 1960s, Boyarsky had supplemented his teaching duties with frequent visits to the university's Office of Instructional Resources, the school's audiovisual facilities where he participated in a series of short instructional television programs with the architecture department, and where independently he made an effort in his own words to learn the medium through the scripting and production of films of his own teaching methods. But his ambition to learn the medium was also contemporaneously fueled by appearances on network television. In the winter of 1965, Boyarsky participated in a series of lectures for a BBC television program entitled Master Builders, Implications of Change on Architectural Ideas, which aired in the spring of 1966. Followed by lectures by Rainer Banham on the street, Joseph Wickert on the town, Robin Middleton on the functional ideal, among others, Boyarsky's program on the subject of Le Corbusier, entitled Towards an Architecture, was the first in the series. Taking the architect's domino of 1914 as his point of departure, Boyarsky's program set out to illustrate the notion of an ideal home of man as the crux of the architect's larger cosmos of ideas on architecture and urbanism. Before filming began, Boyarsky used the lecture at Syracuse University as a rehearsal, these are his words, for the upcoming BBC taping. And after the first round of taping in December of 1965, the show's producers equipped him with a verbatim transcript and slide sequence from the original tape of this first performance in order to help him prepare, rehearse, and edit his lecture for a second round of taping. These rehearsal tools, both the lecture and the script, betray an overlapping territory of academic instruction and televised programming. Indeed, the individual Master Builders episodes themselves took on the format of academic lectures set in a theater occupied by an audience of students, a stylistic production choice that elicited harsh criticism in a review of the series published in the journal Building, which lamented the program's use of projected slides instead of, quote, exploiting the actual process of television itself, end quote provocatively suggesting the possibility of a productive relationship between architectural teaching and the medium's inherent processes, editing, framing, movement, et cetera. The criticism also implicitly identified conflicting audience demographics, that is the live audience of students seated within an auditorium and embodied within the production process versus a mass audience of students at home who received the televised lecture as a totality. In either instance, however, according to the review, the lectures remained marred by the stultifying effects that come from the act of reading from notes or a script. As a presenter for the Le Corbusier episode of Master Builders, Boyarsky had indeed gleaned the mechanics of a scripted program, a degree of organization which he observed to be noticeably absent during his own appearance on a local news program in Chicago. He described the latter in a letter to his wife, Elizabeth. He writes, no rehearsal, no direction, no control over the sequence of slides, no screen or anything to talk to, and a rigorous schedule to fit into. I had about 10 slides left and was quite incomplete when time was called mid-sentence, and they began lighting up and asking, what's next? I suppose the idea is you just don't prepare at all an ad lib, and that way you can encompass all the practical little details of their setup and not be embarrassed, end quote. Now, through a different set of documents, I'd like to pursue Boyarsky's ad lib methodological lesson, this ambiguity of what's next that is paradoxically shaped by the television network's rigorous schedule and unforgiving economy of time. And these documents will also enable us to return to the dual notion of renewal in terms of both media and pedagogy. So I here offer a comparison uh, to illustrate how the convivial promise of Boyarsky's model 
posed a radical departure from the blueprint of modernist professional training that had come to dominate architecture schools during the post-war period and that had indeed nearly transfigured the AA just prior to, just prior to Boyarsky's arrival there. And that's a story that's uh, not to be told in this context. On the left, the well-known diagram of the Bauhaus curriculum, that mythic origin of modernist education, in which architecture is positioned as a destination reached by a concentric arrangement of practices. Here juxtaposed with an issue of the AA events list. <coughs> At the school's in-house weekly diary of events that had in fact predated Boyarsky's chairmanship. So here we see an earlier iteration dating from his first term in office, a rather straightforward format, which he significantly revamped in 1973, coinciding with and effect reifying his expansion of the AA's program. First, I'd like to suggest the events list offers the quintessential diagram of his postmodernist reconfiguration of architectural education as a process of selection rather than prescription. So let us take one example. With its comprehensive diary of workshops, seminars, television programs, exhibitions, film screenings, lectures, and courses, all advertised as events that were open to everyone, the documents acted as a type of menu or program guide. And we might also be reminded of Habermas's discussion of newspapers and of a traffic in news emerging in tandem with a traffic in commodities. And here then, perhaps we can speak of media's complicity and a traffic in education. But what we also have is a script for the school community, structuring the institution's overwhelming number of day-to-day -day activities, mapping them out hour by hour, room by room, only to reset the agenda anew with each week's printing and provoking a perpetual dissolution of the educational process into a multiplicity of trajectories and destinations. This a productive tension between order and improvisation that echoes Boyarsky's lessons in television. Indeed, so the story goes, after explaining the AA's platform to Jean-Francois Lyotard, no less, most likely sometime during the late 80s, the philosopher responded to Boyarsky by incredulously characterizing the school chairman's rapid assessment of the discipline's unremitting modulations and inflections as le scanning, a comment that carried a criticism of a relentless economy of time, reminiscent of the what's next attitude of the network TV crew, and yet an apt metaphor in its dual invocation of the process of scanning and transmission of images intrinsic to the medium of television and of Leotard's own investment in disarticulating the transmission of meta-narratives. But we might here co-opt the very process of scanning that was thus reciprocally demanded of contemporary readers of these documents, which were essentially screens onto which the changing program was continuously projected and which indeed offer historiographical maps for the historian. So surveying the events list for week 14 in the 1974 spring summer term, we find, for example, a workshop on photomontage, uh, Christian Norberg Schultz lecturing in a course on semiology and architecture, Paolo de Ganello, uh, oh, sorry, Horacio Torres's presentation on Latin American cities, Paolo de Ganello of Arcazum invited by Bernard Schumi to lecture on Italian urban politics, an event to take place provocatively just before a seminar on Aldo Rossi, and Italian rationalism given by Ilias Angelis, Leon Creer, and Talos Agoropoulos. And among the list of general notices on the back cover, we find an announcement for the launch of TVAA, which was to provide daily hour-long broadcasts to be played on monitors within the school. So prompted by Boyarsky, the endeavor was coordinated and overseen by the communications unit, a newly established department which offered instruction in various media from silk screening to drawing to video and which was directed by Archigram <coughs> member Dennis Crompton. So here we see the communications unit staff in 1974 next to its TV studio located on the AA's ground floor and stocked with secondhand equipment including three cameras and an adjacent control room for editing and broadcasting visible in the photograph uh, on the left and seen here in plan. So wired to the studio, the school lecture hall, a fixed television monitor on the first floor, as well as other monitors within the school 
The, con the control room would broadcast from and to the AA, both live and recorded materials. Indeed, these included general announcements, films, as well as films and videos made by students of their work, uh, of their work. Uh, replays of off-air television programs, lectures, and other school events, as well as interviews with personalities visiting the AA whom students might not otherwise have had the opportunity to encounter and which were staged and recorded in the studio. As the notice in the events list invited, the channel will be open to everyone in the school as a forum, a platform, a tool, an electric cow to be milked by anyone with fingers nimble enough to take the plunge. And of course, you'll notice in the, the clip of Blow Up, we have a series of AA students uh, who are listed as a galaxy of stars in the events list. So TVA's activities would carry on in various forms into the following decades, and certainly testimony to its legacy is the school's present extensive video archive of its lectures and events, and this is happening right now, of course. Um, however, it was in TVAA's earliest years, roughly between 1974 and 1976, when its identity was the strongest, its ambitions the highest, and when its programming was at its most diverse, airing fairly consistently at 1 o'clock each afternoon. Indeed, this, in December of 1973, just a few months prior to its launch, AA tutor David Green had in fact articulated the value of such an undertaking, and in the pages of the events list, no less, announcing to the school community that editing and video techniques would be explored in his unit. Green also speculated that a closed circuit TV system in the AA would offer, quote, new possibilities for changing the academic structure, end quote, suggesting that the production and international distribution of video newsletters could initiate a broader learning network. A resource to be harnessed and manipulated, video he contended is not a magic wand, it is a tool. His comments on the pedagogical potential of television and video invite a few critical points on the historical context of the integration of such media into the AA's academic program. Nearly a decade after the publication of McLuhan's theories on the extensions of man and after the introduction of the Sony Portapac, by the mid-1970s, television and video were already deeply embedded in avant-garde artistic practices. And we might note here, of course, that Green had his own connection to uh, a network of conceptual artists in Britain in the late 60s and in the 70s. And to be sure, by the early 1970s, television and video were hovering on that fetishistically fine line between art and architecture. Yet seen against such contemporary work, which critically tackled the political, social, psychological, and aesthetic dimensions of mass media, issues which David Jocelyn and Felicity Scott have recently addressed, on the surface, the broadcasting endeavor of TV AA appears far tamer, perhaps. And to investigate further, we now return to Archimags, whose five or six episodes were produced during the spring of 1975 and recorded in the communication studio, replete with a curtain backdrop and furnished to accommodate presenters and guests. Now from its changing lineup of hosts providing commentary on current publications, to its graphics, down to its very theme song, Allegro Non Troppo from Malcolm Arnold's English Dances, Archimags appropriated a format that would have been familiar to viewers at the AA at this time, that of the popular television program, What the Papers Say, incidentally the second longest running program on British television airing between 1956 and 2008. As Archimag's host in February of 1975, Peter Murray, then editor at Building Design, reviews the latest news in architecture, comparing, and not without bias, his own journal's press coverage with that of its rival, the Architects' Journal. The program formula, however, was not fixed. Godfried Boyle, today an expert on renewable resources, participates in another episode as editor of Undercurrents, the magazine of alternative technologies and radical science founded in 1972. Boyle elaborates on these two terms in conversations with communication staff member James Meller, explaining the magazine's origins, its production, and its promotion of small-scale uses of science and technology outside of the military-industrial complex, a concept that would be discussed further in his forthcoming book, Radical Technology, published in 1976. 
But might we then identify TVAA itself as a small-scale use of technology deployed within the context of an independent school of architecture? For not only did it appropriate the existing conventions of popular television, but TVAA also manipulated established methods of inst institutionalized instruction for the purposes of continuing the transmission of architectural messages that had previously been confined to print. From teaching machines to video lessons, from closed circuit television to the concept of a teleuniversity, realized in 1969 as the Open University in the UK. If the artistic avant-garde had critically co-opted the instruments of mass media during the late 60s, by that time various forms of communications technology had already been institutionalized in educational systems worldwide, signaling an immaterialization of the sites of disciplinarity. With such experiments in instructional technology well underway since the immediate post-war period, we might then begin to reframe our examination of the uses of such media at the AA during the mid-70s, as well as in contemporary experimental architectural practices more broadly. For the educational uses of such tools did not escape, but rather obsessed architects at the tumultuous close of the 1960s a moment when the uncertainty of the future of architectural education reverberated internationally and when in turn pedagogy, charged with an armature of media, posed an engaging design problem, essentially one of program concerning the circulation of ideas, information, and bodies outside of existing educational systems and sites, whether taking the format of video seminars as proposed by Yona Friedman or Ant Farm's Truck Stop Network. Indeed, illustrating a collapse of the school, the magazine, and video, the April 1973 issue of AD documented Price's own experiment, Polyarch, a proposed reconfiguration of architectural education in the UK as a network of specialized learning centers, transportation links, and communications technology, and which was put to the test in February 1973 in collaboration with AD and a group of AA students who refurbished a London city bus, which they outfitted with audiovisual equipment and used as their mode of transportation. As a disembodied price who didn't participate in the tour, informed his students via video, quote, the learning process is one in which one should be able to rethink the direction one is going in without recrimination or losing points or not getting medals, end quote. Such a rewiring of education as a continuous yet highly efficient process rather than finite trajectory towards a static body of knowledge and which imposed the onus of pedagogy on students was thus instigated by a broader process of feedback between media, educational reform, and the perceived imperatives as well as limits of architecture's institutions. And of course, such a process of feedback can be traced through Boyarsky's own work preceding his chairmanship in 1971, not just in his lessons in television during the 60s, but also in the establishment of his own International Institute of Design and its summer sessions held between 1970 and 1972. An educational network activated by various forms of media and which anticipated his experiment at the AA where the IID was essentially domesticated. And so we return to the plan of the AA, both architectural and programmatic, both a frame and a limit. So, oh, sorry. <coughs> well, just imagine that they're playing. Colin Fournier with Archigram members Peter Cook and Warren Chalk in conversation with the Italian collective Grupo Labyrinto on the different attitudes towards politics in the architectural scenes in London and Italy. The Dutch architect John Habrocken interviewed by Haig Beck discussing his seminal 1962 book supports the notion of flexibility that it put forth and the current outdatedness of the very term in the 1970s. Martin Pauli Speaking with communication staff member Gus Coral about his research on garbage housing, his proposal for an increased confluence between industrial production and housing for a more efficient use of materials and waste. A lecture by the Japanese architect Arata Izusaki on recent work. 
Might we not recast such images broadcast on TVAA as the educational video newsletters of which Green had spoken, and which his contemporaries had tested in a myriad of design proposals, yet which also, however, had been formalized in non-architectural learning institutions? For if the architectural avant-garde's media experiments in institutional mobility had propagated a continuous decentralization of the sites and methods of architectural pedagogy, yet had appropriated and manipulated the instructional tools and methods of existing educational systems to do so, then such an ongoing process was, in effect, not only centralized, but also cultivated at the AA. Put differently, the school came to embody both a radicalization of institutional practices and the institutionalization of radical practices. Once confined to print, architectural messages were now harnessed, produced, compounded, and amplified within the space of the school. Yet despite its simultaneity of media and messages, and despite the process of le scanning, in Leotard's words, that marked its departure from previous educational models. With its multi-channel program, we might here invoke Raymond Williams's analysis of broadcast television as a sequence of flow in order to reinterpret Boyarsky's well-laid table, a choreographed sequence of variegated units in which the real internal organization is something other than the declared organization, an ever-changing yet highly controlled linearity unfolding within the boundaries of the institution. So to conclude, I'd like to here choreograph my own sequence in order to complicate this imbrication of internal and declared organization and to tease out its pedagogical repercussions. Broadcast on TVAA on February 5th, 1975, Boyarsky interviews architect Peter Eisenman, founder and director of the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York and who was passing through London. Prompted by the school chairman, Eisenman outlines the history of the independent institute he established in 1967, its cultural and publishing activities, as well as its educational initiatives. Describing his intentions to develop a milieu in which educational and theoretical work could coexist, Eisenman suggests that the AA posed such a hybrid model. And in fact, Boyarsky would in turn um, look for, or ask Peter Eisenman for advice when he's setting up the IID. Uh, in the late 60s. Indeed, that the underlying ambitions of these two directors of two very different postmodern institutions were not so distant was noted in the second issue of the London-based magazine Net from Peter Cook's gallery Artnet, and which resonated in the rather haunting superimpositions of the two figures which pervade the edited interview footage. But this interview would not be Eisenman's only appearance at the school during this visit. A guest slot in the school's programming also included a seminar on the work of James Sterling, an event broadcast on TVAA on February 13, 1975, and which in fact took place three weeks earlier in the school's TV studio, quote, humming with video promise, end quote. This according to a scurrilous report on the performance of the terrific critic, with his American accent and emphatic hand gestures, which was published in Ghost Dance Times, the school's in-house broadsheet. Initiated by Boyarsky contemporaneously with TVAA, Ghost Dance Times was edited by the critic Martin Pauly, whom we've already met on television. The weekly newspaper functioned as yet another aperture for institutional surveillance and exhibition. Within the frame of one medium, the discursive mechanisms of another were refracted, if not distorted, and all within the space of the school. Now, it's through the very posture of the student body, both literally and figuratively, uh, that we might read the educational stakes of such a hermetically prismatic institutional matrix, perhaps implicitly fueled by the persistent question, what's next? And although I'm showing a photograph of Boyarsky's and tutors reviewing student work, it serves as a reminder that the teacher is certainly part of the bigger picture. In his 1964 book, Understanding Media, 
McLuhan begins his chapter on television by claiming that the child accustomed to watching television struggles when confronted with static printed information. Compelled to draw their eyes closer to the page, children, quote, bring to print all their senses, and yet print rejects them, end quote. This McLuhan writes, uh, an observation on the labored choreography between the body and media that had been melancholically heralded four decades earlier by Walter Benjamin in his ruminations on the movement of print, once laid to rest in the horizontal plane of the book, but then summoned to the dictatorial perpendicular of newspapers, films, and advertisements. From the surface of the table to the surface of the page to the illuminated surface of the screen, at the school, multiple horizons seem to be projected in multiple dimensions, leaving the student without a straight path, yet bounded by resolute, though perhaps imperceptible, pedagogical limits. Thank you. I'm not sure, I guess the plan is a round table after? Yeah. Uh, okay. But maybe this, you know, transitions um, also. I was in interested, it, it, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and, and it was, you know, showing on the screen as you're speaking, um, maybe, made, at least made me think about not only the sort of penetration of various media technologies and so on into uh, architectural education here and elsewhere, but but also of the history, uh, historicity really of, of these media themselves. So, I mean, you know, the grainy footage, all of this has the effect of, and I think this is generally true for archival material, of, um, of producing a kind of aura, if you like. I mean, that, that's what's sort of odd about this, is that it you know, the recovery of mediatic materials seems to run counter a bit to Benjamin's argument by, you know, inadvertently or not, by, you know, sort of restoring a kind of mystique to, to these, mm. to this stuff. So, so on the one hand, there's the kind of, you know, there's that reversal of that economy, but, but on the other, there's the, what's very, very noticeable, at least to me, like, for example, in the series that Bayarsky was part of with various other people, Robin Middleton and others, mm. um, the last, one, the last installment was, you know, architecture or revolution. Now it seems to me that, that the history of television, closed circuit and otherwise, it has developed as such as to exclude that possibility today. I mean, in other words, you're not allowed to say revolution on television anymore, mm. unless it's, you know, in quotes, in effect. I don't know to what extent in that particular setting that was a real question. For Le Corbusier, it was a real question. It was a real historical question. So that's what's kind of interesting I is, in a sense, the, the way in which the protocols of, of media have developed historically, such as to reformat themselves, you know, as, com as TV becomes more commercial, as, you know, so, I'm in so the, I guess the underlying question is what's at stake in, in recovering and historicizing the media as media, from the, not so much in relation to architectural education, but from the point of view of how media, these, these multi multimedia actually work. Do you have any? Thoughts about that? You mean? Like what their rules are. You know, what's the rule? The rule now, I'm saying in a sort of schematic way, that you're not allowed to say certain things on television. Mm. Or, of course, the promise of CCTV was that it was a potentially revolutionary medium in the political sense, as well as in the, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of these experiments in the 60s that, that wanted this to be a, an opening, rather than, and it turned out, by and large, to close back down. Mm. Well, it's interesting that CCTV, if I, have it right actually started by it was a mechanism for moderate monitoring um, certain rocket launches I think in Germany so it I think that the transition happens pretty rapidly in terms of the way it becomes a, a device of a totally different nature I mean to the OU you know it's 
it's huge leaps um, from there. So uh, I'm not sure if your question is about how I, as a researcher, kind of deal with the question of aura, or? Well, both. Uh, I mean, I may, that's why I said maybe this is a subject more generally for the mm -hmm. round table. But th the status of the artifact, you know, as an historical artifact, which theoretically is sort of dead, you know, like uh, archives are supposed to be dead. But what's interesting is when you screen them, yeah. and I know that, you know, from experience also, like when you look at this stuff, there's a kind of strange presence that returns. And you even said, you know, haunting images and things like yeah. this. So, so there's something going on in, in these artifacts. And then on top of that, there is the kind of actual, and as it were, social history of television yeah. that goes in, in the direction towards more control rather than less, you know, more or less. Yeah. So. And then I, as an audience, am a completely different type of audience and cutting and pasting it as I do. Um, but yeah, the, with video, I mean, I don't know if this is really a response, but I was talking to Dennis Crompton about publishing a little transcript of this film that he had made with Bannum, and he said to me, oh, you know, I can digitally um, copy the stills from my digital copy on the computer, or I can do it from the original, but they're gonna come out kind of grainy. And my immediate reaction was, well, that's great, because then you understand that that is a video still, and it's not a photograph, so it kind of triggers you to realize that it's just, you know, not even a fraction of a second, you know, part of a bigger process, so. Could I kind of um, <coughs> ask that question in a kind of slightly, a little bit of concrete way? Because I thought there was a particular image which kind of makes uh, his point about kind of aura. And it also makes, I think, possible one of the uses that this kind of archive material can have, although this is not strictly archival. I mean, what I'm going to talk about. It's, it's the shot you have from the beginning of Blow Up, uh, which seems to me to present us now with a kind of historically illegible set of images. That is to say, viewed from now, uh, it would be my suspicion that no one can see that image of the kind of jeep going up to the economist building of all things uh, without feeling some profound sense of disjuncture. That is to say, under what possible historical circumstances <coughs> could young people <laughs> dressed up, as it were, in, in sort of... Uh, mid-60s, I don't know, hippie or whatever clothes, why would they be moving ecstatically towards a building which now looks, in a sense, rather settled and corporate? To recover, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, no, 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 Tony, I mean, I'm not saying it is. <coughs> I'm saying that pe people don't walk down St. James thinking that's a bit radical for, for here or anything. I mean, it's, it's been appropriated. Now, in a sense, the disjunction that the image presents needs to be recaptured, in a sense, by a critical history, which actually makes the two elements of the image actually fit together. I mean, please, I'm not saying that the building is conservative or anything. I'm saying it's capable and has been appropriated as a rather settled object. People will say, oh, that's rather sort of classical, or they will say, it reminds me of a sort of Renaissance whatever, you know. It's not, it's not really a kind of question. Mm. I think now we should just move to a discussion before tea. Uh, where the purpose really was to <coughs> <coughs> consider the videos, um, to consider the AA archive in general, and AA publishing in terms of being elements which contribute to a knowledge indirectly of the architectural past. <coughs> so to the people who Ed works in the library, uh, but is also, I think, sort of the AA's official <coughs> 
um, archivist. And in a sense, in this kind of brief session, we're asking them uh, to kind of speculate, in a way, on how they think those elements have an effect on the AA in terms of representing its history, partly, and therefore indirectly kind of architectural history. Maybe, Tom, you could just start. Sure. Is that on? <coughs> well, well, in a way, I mean, compared to Ed or, or Irene, my own position is a little more tangential in the sense that, um, you know, that Ed is the archivist and Irene is occupying the archive. But, you know, I'm very much on the edge in the sense of that. But so much so that the most kind of literal archive I've engaged with recently has really been just through pastiche that in the latest issue of AA Files, I published a postcard um, that uh, Dennis Crompton had sent to Alvin Boyarsky in 1972. Um, um, and it was to accompany a piece on Boyarsky. Um, and my designers and I, in a sense, thought this was a tremendously clever little thing, that it could be a little bit of an archive or an artifact for every one of my readers. But in a sense, it kind of came back to haunt us in that, that I've, ha I've been inundated by letters and emails from librarians who are confused by this thing, that they, they're sending it back to me. They're saying, they're all emailing me saying that, that someone's left a relic in A files, <laughs> and do you want it back? I mean, they've even tried to send it back. So that the stamp on the back of the postcard that isn't a stamp, but it's a, <laughs> that it's a printout of a stamp, they've tried to kind of get some more life out of this stamp. But, but in a way, for me, in a sort of cliched sense, the most kind of literal archive is in a sense the image. It's the thing that goes in between the text. Um, and as much as I kind of enjoy playing the role of graphic designer and playing with images and text, um, I still have a certain kind of hesitancy about that kind of view of the archive. That, um, and I have a kind of problem with a, a view of kind of architectural research that is always that privileges the kind of retrieval of these sort of artifacts. Um, not only because I think it sort of it presupposes a kind of a kind of r rather romantic vision of research that there is something out there that is actually going to give you the answer. Um, you know, it's as if everyone's going to you're eventually going to find Walter Benjamin's black suitcase. But I think. But it also affects text, and in, in essence, this is the archive that I'm really dealing with. You know, I'm more of a reader. I'm not producing these, this material. I'm actually reading it. And I think when you, when you structure research through a physical archive of artifacts, it lends itself to a kind of way of writing about architecture that is compartmentalized. It's highly sort of um, articulated as if it's captions. And I'm much more, I'm much keener on a more fluent, homogenous idea that is based around the idea rather than the object. But in a, w but in a way, kind of more interesting for me as a just an observer, as an outsider, is that the, there's a different kind of archive has actually appeared recently, and that's an oral archive. That as, as you've sort of spoken about today, that history in a sense has become more and more a, a history of the immediate um, past. And because of that, so many of its practitioners are actually around and able to be spoken to. And you know, lots of, lots of the essays I'm dealing with now absorb a kind of conversational or an interview or quotations from actual, um, you know, their subjects. And I think, again, for me, this is interesting because it, it slightly recasts um, a kind of, it reinvents a model of architectural writing that isn't simply in third person, but is actually uh, a adopts you know first person narrative and the conversational tones so it's actually much more of a kind of radical move I think. Ed, can you yeah um, I mean basically I, I haven't been trained as an arch uh, as a um, architect um, so I'm looking uh, I've enjoyed very much today's uh, conversations and particularly intrigued by constant references to death and um, certainly the kind of the archive is a morgue in the sense in the, in the uh, talk where the cadaver is being cut up. Um, but also in Brian's talk, he talked about um, the solitary wanderer. 
um, who's uh, on the edge of certainties. Um, and reminds me, the combination of death and that, that reminded me of a, a saying or a, um, a quote, I forget who made it now, but called the archive is, is a space of dead certainties. And to me that's interesting. It's, we're getting, we get so many people coming in for so many different reasons and looking at so many different materials in so many different ways. It's, um, it's just fascinating how, how um, many different histories can be found in the archive. We get people, artists coming in looking for the found object. Um, we get people, sociologists coming in and looking through um, all the, the kind of ephemera of what the students are doing in the 70s, the 80s. We get um, historians looking at demographics for female students in the 20s. Um, we get conservationists coming in trying to recreate a building. Obviously, you have the, the problem with um, archives. With, with our own particular archive, we're dealing with representations of buildings. You can't necessarily archive a building. Um, it's uh, a building is changes over time. Necessi of necessity, we, our archive is um, capturing in one portfolio, perhaps, um, representations at a particular time of a building or a concept. Um, and so for me, the whole, whole idea whole today is so many unanswered questions, but just so many possibilities as well. Um, and that, that's really my, my kind of attitude at the moment, is so, many, so much possibilities, as, as shown in your research, the ways to approach and to... to uh well, it's, uh, it's obviously become like now, it seems to me, a sort of positive element of the AA. I mean, the first stage was actually uh, to stop throwing things away. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I mean, I can speak for her since she's not here, but Mickey always used to be terribly frightened <coughs> every time a, a skip appeared uh, in the square because people from the AA would sort of, you know, take the opportunity of the skip being here to throw away priceless materials. I mean, she recovered from one skip uh, two artworks by Paolozzi, uh, which otherwise would have just gone. Uh, and I believe it was a skip that took our 19th century collection of... Uh, I can't remember what it was that, that suddenly kind of vanished. Um, so we do now keep ourselves, and I think it's very interesting. Perhaps it's linked in a way, this would be in a sense the next question. People before, during today, uh, have made the point that the students are somewhat, I think the word was uh, agoraphobic, uh, of not wanting to go to the object. And perhaps that drives them back, in a sense, into the school, into its own past, as an initial indirect way of dealing with architecture's past. I mean, a small part of it, but perhaps actually, in a sense, going inside kind of into it. And so I've noticed that, you know, instead of getting essays like my visit to the Acropolis, you get on Le Corbusier's visit to the Acropolis. I mean, the, there's a sort of uh, an at one remove which comes about, as it were, from, from taking seriously not my initial response to architecture, but almost my history of people's responses to it. But the problem with that is if you try and represent that for me in a journal without the Acropolis, you get all kinds of you know, aggravation. You, it still privileges the, 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 the image of the object and that you can't ever sort of get away with simply the, the story of, that, of the visit, whether it's yours or someone else's. So there's a kind of pervasiveness of the artifact in that sense. But again, someone else raised the, you know, the, the problem with the object then, it's like, you know, when you get to it, it's a bit like that sort of song Peggy Lee song from the 50s, like, is that all there is? <laughs> um, which, after all, is what Freud felt in, in yeah. front of uh, the Parthenon, you know, so that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we could sort of push it now. I mean, in what ways can you imagine, in some sense, the interior of the AA and its own past as being a way of reconnecting it? I mean, I. I always noticed, um, in Alvin's case, uh, when I first came and was doing, started doing Friday lectures, I met him once a year to ask how they were going. Uh, 
uh, I was always kind of initially baffled by the fact that whenever we met, all he did was to stare at the plans of the AA. I mean, he actually used them, I mean, uh, you could say at one level as a sort of form of divination. <laughs> but of course, he did, well, that's not really, I mean, he was just using the internal architecture of the AA to think problems through. Uh, and so maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're back, in a sense, in that dimension. Um, how would you feel, I mean, that, 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 that you would connect this work to the current students? Do you think they'd just be interested anyway? I don't know, it's, it's funny, people's relationships to their schools. Um, maybe I'll give one weird example. I do have a Facebook account. I know you were all making fun of Facebook during lunch, but I do have one, but Columbia, the School of Architecture of Columbia asked to be my friend. And I thought, I don't think I want to be its friend. So I just ignored it. And I thought, this is really bizarre for this to be happening here. So... They keep asking again, though, don't they? Yes, they, they did ask they don't me take again. No it's Ben not. Prosty, I think. <laughs> I don't think I was attacking. I just said I was in favor of the Chinese government banning it. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I we learned by nine. If someone comes up and says, can I be your friend? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but having school pride, let's say, for lack of a better term, is kind of a tricky thing when you're a student because you always feel, you know, that there's some sort of divide so, uh, between, say, faculty and students and whatnot, and there's sort of rites of passage that you go through until you grow up in a certain way. So I don't know, I haven't been here for a while, so I don't, I don't really know what the sense of school pride is. Let's say that's very American, isn't it? But <laughs> um, yes, I don't think school pride. I, <coughs> you find it difficult to sort of introduce the school song or something, <laughs> certainly on mornings when you're going to have architectural history afterwards. But it is always interesting for me to get the, um, the AA newsletters. I don't know what they're called now, but when I get them in the mail, because I always know that there's going to be something from the archive that's reproduced there with maybe like five line descriptions attached to it. And I always kind of wonder, is that enough? Or is, what is this accomplishing? You know, it, you read it in three seconds and then you turn the page and, you know, have has the school done some sort of historical duty to, you know, excavate some tiny fraction of its past, you know, to catch your attention, you know, as you flip through the pages. So I, I'm always a little bit wary when I see this uh, very quick enthusiasm to sort of reproduce things that are found and just keep uh -huh. moving along, so. Mm, me too. <laughs> 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 I think it, it, uh, the strength of the archive it depends on context and the, it, the yeah. strength of the archive over the published um, photograph is that can it, it can produce depth. It can, you can, if you look at a finished a project review, for example, it can show just through lack of space, it can show X number of photographs of a unit. You can go down to <coughs> the archive and you can see all the portfolio drawings for one project and see all the research notes and you can, you know, I went to see a portfolio from a lady who had from the 30s, yes, uh, day before yesterday. And amongst the town planning project that was being done was a whole, uh, whole um, role of civil Spanish Civil War posters and Communist Party um, information and booklets and what have you. And that kind of social context is, is um, just invaluable in, in trying to read But the, the thing that's puzzled me slightly about the AA's archive is why no one has done a kind of cover version of AA briefs. That in a you have a whole archive of every project that's been run here. Yeah. And no, I wish we had. <laughs> but 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 they but they but they're there in the form of prospectuses. Yeah. They're there. There's yeah. a kind of register of them, mm -hmm. and the, the archive is still always a visual thing. Mm -hmm. It isn't a, a, a more of a pedagogical object. Yeah. <coughs> but that's mm -hmm. totally accessible in the library. Absolutely, so but it that makes but it I even more puzzling. I kind of feel like if it was reproduced as the you know second edition of the projects review from the 1970s or something, it would kind of. No, I'm not. In, I mean, why aren't people teaching a course that was a ta course taught in 1972? Uh -huh. 
come up this hour. Um, I, I have a friend who's an archivist, and she gets exasperated <laughs> by people going to the archive with a previously conceived question and the expectation that the archive will provide an answer to it. And her advice is, when you go to an archive, you should listen to the archive. You should hear what the archive wants to tell you that most archives have been uh, produced and organized for some particular purpose and that they have their own peculiar uh, structure and arrangements of holdings, uh, their own gaps, uh, and that's what you want, in a way, to hear. And I'm just curious to hear from the panel what you think the archive of the AA has to say to us, what is its own particular oracle? To me, it's 160 years of neglect. <laughs> Hot, heck of a big backlog. <laughs> well, I think one thing, I mean, it's a, it's a minor thing that it would tell students now, um, is when the students sort of, you know, identify certain people as being interesting and famous architects from 35 years ago, uh, if they kind of see what courses they were taking, they would be uh, surprised by how historical uh, that was. They would be surprised to see, you know, that, that when people deliberately still constituted themselves as oppositional and in some sense avant-gardist in, say, the early 70s, mid 70s, that actually also took on a political form which by its nature was also historical. So when Brett said this morning, you know, that a unit spends its time, you know, fairly meticulously going through kind of stuff on constructivism, uh, I was thinking it might be sort of quite difficult to do that now, actually. Or, I mean, to do, when I say to do it, I mean, first of all, to attract students to do it. Um, so I think, you know, a, a knowledge of, for example, in detail what courses were going on would be quite surprising to people and good in that sense. Well, actually, Mark, you've just anticipated what I was going to try to raise. Um, it was very impressive watching those uh, video clips and the account of the latest technology in, in mediation and, and networking that was going on. And that utopian moment about uh, when there was some hope about uh, real-time TV transforming uh, institutional relations. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking, well, hold it. At the same time, all these people um, were bringing in um, a lot of architectural history. And Robin Middleton was a serious student uh, and scholar of the 18th and 19th century in France. And then there was the great Beaux-Arts conference uh, in, was it 75 or 76, 77? 77. Um, and I was thinking, well, what was, you know, is it possible in terms of the archive to see any kind <laughs> of, not a fault line exactly, but some kind of, um, kind of, what's the word, spline, um, between those aspects of the school that were really being involved in, in, in uh, transform mediation and the historical scholarship that was going on and that was being published in ARQ and then through a, a quite drastic change in AA files. Mm -hmm. Well, for my bigger project, as I said in the beginning, I'm not really interested in doing an institutional history. So in the dissertation I have, you know, this is basically one chapter which deals with the uses of media and pedagogy, but I have a separate chapter that deals specifically with the teaching of history, but I just it wasn't ready to present that yet. But So I'm, I'm 
trying to illustrate in the project that there's different layers going on within the institution and that I'm not trying to create some fixed identity for this period that, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm sure Robin Middleton wasn't very interested in using television, but he's one of many players that are operating within the school at that time. So all of these people are doing different things at the same time, sometimes intersecting, sometimes totally ignoring each other. So, But, but Brian, you're right. that the, It's quite interesting that that kind of high watermark of the AA's design culture was actually a moment deep, you know, deep in history. That A Files reveals that the very first issues are full of pieces, in a sense that the design work is, is merely the uh, infill. That the, it's all a historical essay by uh, Francis Yates, Morton Crook, Tony Vidler, um, you know, that, that's actually the kind of meat and potatoes of A-Files then. And I think that it did actually <laughs> intersect quite a bit with the design culture. So, you know, Tony Vidler came and taught with Rem and Elias and Gallus, and I think that's when Zaha was a student and he told me the story about how he gave her some exercise about the Marquis de Sade. So it, it's not so um, cut and dry, I think, the division between the units no, and I, the I, history. I, I really don't think it is cut and dry. Yeah. Uh, I imagine that if there is a line, it's a very faint line and it's going like this and it's folding over and over and it's dovetailed and so on. I want to give a lecture called <coughs> The Animated Archive. And the idea was not mine, it was from Malru. Everything goes into an archive. <coughs> Any archive you have is only partial compared to what is possible. So, you know, there's an enormous archive of all the things that history has produced. And so any particular archive is just a little fraction of that. So what's important is not the archive as a whole. You can't tell the history of mankind by total an archive. It's beyond comprehension to be able to read the whole thing. What you do is you just burrow into it. And you find a few things that fit you and you put them together. But, but Bob, you see that ni there's that nice emblematic image of that with Malraux standing behind by his piano with <coughs> sort of the pages of that um, of his book all laid across the floor. In a sense, the archive is everything in his room, in his living room. Everything across his floor is actually constitutes the archive. Can I? I well, I thought of maybe trying to repose the question I was trying to ask uh, Irene before around what some of you have been saying, uh, even the relic, you know, the kind of beauty of, of something that seems, you know, ironic or, 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 or tongue-in-cheek being received in the post as authentic, suggests maybe the need for, some, for a rather more disenchanted relationship with these artifacts. I mean, th this is why I was asking about the aura of, uh, I mean, I, I must say something more on the order of is that all there is when you go to an art? Because, you know, this is really what happens anyway, you know, when one, all the time, when one goes, usually long trips are involved, there's all kinds of arrangements, and, you know, oh, is that it? Uh, even when there's piles of material. So, so one of the possible consequences of an institution, uh, you know, sort of, in, uh, sort of historicizing itself in this way, uh, you know, or at least the risks, uh, is of a kind of re-enchantment on the order of, you know, maybe myth even, um, that is or usually organized around proper names, uh, that, um, you know, people who write letters, who show up on TV, who, th there's a kind of re-inscription uh, of, of, of a certain set of <coughs> personalities, in a way, into history, that can, I think, at least be dialecticized, if not countered directly. Um, with with uh, an, another view of history, which is rather less enchanted with those personalities and rather more comfortable with the emptiness of their words and their papers and their photographs and all of the other material, that itself is historically very, very compelling. I'm not trying saying it this in a negative way. I'm saying it in the sense that 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 uh, you know a truly critical disposition vis-a-vis -vis an archive of any kind seems to me to require at least a, a component, a dimension of disenchantment. Mm. Right. Mm. I mean, I, I entirely agree. This archives are always, you know, traditionally um, 
convey an authority upon objects within it, and they produce a history and you know archives have been associated with state power. They're always you know it's all, all to do with power um, to tell a story or to tell sets of stories. And um, my position is I just have to rely on, you know on the reader to be aware, to have a conscious reader really, who aware, aware of these things that are going on. Um, but but I think that also to accept, I agree with you, Reinhold. But I think that, uh, and I I like the way that that there's a kind of irreverence to that, and that it challenges the sanctity of the archive. And in, and in a sense, it challenges that kind of le that benediction almost that you were saying, Adrian. That in a sense, the archive gives you the truth, and you should be led by the archive. Uh, you know, I think that there is a there is a point when you uh, engage with the archive, but then there is a point when you, in the writing, when you question that, and you actually there is some kind of synthesis. Y the archive can't be the end point of any point of research. It has to be the beginning. I'm always puzzled by <coughs> the, the box in the archive. I mean, yeah. w with a library, <laughs> each book is <laughs> there on the shelf and you can see the name on the seam of the book. Um, of course, you've got to read the book. The book might put, has all kinds of mysteries in it. But in an archive, it's usually something like a box, and you don't know what's in the box. Uh, and very often, the people who have stored it have roughly classified things. And it's only when you open the box that you realize that they didn't know what they put in the box. And you are finding something. And when I was talking before, I used the word archipelago. Um, and it did, it did seem to me that the, that the word seemed to work very well with, with an archive because it's like as if you know an archipelago, but you've never been landed on any of the islands and you've never gone into the interior. And occasionally, you, you know, if, you're, if you're teaching, uh, you, you see the students go ashore and then they head off inland and you never <laughs> see them again. <laughs> Um, but uh, to me, that uh, there's a very strange condition I in in the archive where it's it's it, it's not fully indexed, mm. and yet it's not forgotten either. Yeah, I mean, I, s I see your point, and um, obviously we have, we have archival description, which tends to place things not in physical boxes but in categories, which. Um, these days, they, uh, there are various international standards and ways of doing it, which are um, necessarily a framework which you put on the archive, and that's, at the end of the day, subjective. Um, and so that conditions how the user gets to the material and finds material or doesn't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it is, these things are a, a, a difficult and a starting point rather than a finishing point, I think, a kind of point of entry. Yeah. Does anyone, maybe from the back of the room, have any questions? We seem to be, questions seem to be congregating at the front. Mm -hmm. But Tony is up. <coughs> Contemporary, uh, uh, we've, we've, we've almost be, there's an edge that we're becoming over institutionalized. What I liked seeing about that work was the kind of that the, the uh, that the BAA was desperately trying to say that it wasn't institutionalized, and going back to, for that information to be kind of raw, raw, raw and available is. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to you for kind of a giving us this splattering it on your screen, as it were. So um, we're, all, we're, we're becoming very self-conscious about how we use this material, and um, um, uh, which uh, so I'm just very grateful that perhaps, for me, it was refreshing to kind Thank of you. just to remember that, that perhaps the relationship between kind of uh, uh, history is the word, but shall we say cultural context and how the designer or the design school taps into that information and starts to use it can be kind of much more dynamic than perhaps sometimes it is at the present time. And going back to the idea of 
the, those, those great conferences, somebody mentioned the Fers Al, which was fantastic, and when Alvin brought Leverance to us, you know, um, when that exhibition came, the school absorbed it and, and the units and absorbed that, that, that it, it, the school's exhibitions and the work that went on at that time always reflected the kind of zeitgeist or the kind of what the school was looking for at a particular time and that uh, immediacy between the two was, 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 was and I think still is very exciting but, but there's always this I mean modern life and digital kind of life tends to have some institutionalizing kind of effect on on, on individuals and, uh, and, and how we group ourselves. But I, I think what Tony says kind of dramatizes uh, a certain kind of ambivalence that we're bound to entertain about the archival. On the one hand, you know, it's extremely interesting and it enables students to kind of experience indirectly uh, the kind of vivacity of what was occurring. On the other hand, I have a sort of feeling that if Cedric were kind of sitting here at the moment and saw that, as it were, the archives were becoming a kind of sub-industry of the school, uh, he'd probably recommend that you know we now took them all out into the square and burnt them. Uh, so you know that there has to, to be a certain retained. And I think one of the interesting things that's come up is that insofar as students are more likely <coughs> to come to grips with certain architectural history through a sort of interiorization of their interest within the institution of its own history, the risk run really is that, that in respect to architecture in general, they run the risk of having a permanently indirect form of experience. I mean, one which, in a sense, you, uh, uh, that, that uh, Reinhold kind of identified, almost a sort of post-experience. It's like, how was your experience of the Acropolis? I don't know, but I do know what Corbs was like. Um, it's like, have you had a feeling? No, but I know someone who has. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I think probably, unless there's another <laughs> question at the back. <coughs> Please, sorry, can someone? This is just a question about how the archives are, are used. I don't know if it's how they're used on a, on a daily or weekly basis. Just thinking of ways in which, um, using the notion of expanded cinema or expanded field, the, there could be a sort of expanded use of the archive, which involves a very direct so in some way, I think what we, people have been talking about is the kind of inertia that comes through the notion of storage uh, and how uh, the vivacity that we, we, we're referring to is kind of there as an aura or that we're, we're reviewing with a certain kind of reverence, how that, how that vitality might actually be accessed by students being forced to, I say forced, that sounds, it gives away a lot, but, but, but encountering the archive in ways which are not actually necessarily about reverence or historical or even sequence, but actually making a different kind of sense which involved, as I say, trying to, trying to, trying to produce an encounter which had a kind of constant presence, I suppose, rather than reverence and inertia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if I knew, I'd be doing it. Um, yeah, so any suggestions? Uh, um, uh, we Personally speaking, at the moment, we're just so busy just trying to survive, trying to preserve things, trying to get some order to know what we have even. Um, and I've got to prioritize some things, and I'm hoping people come from the outside. We're, 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 getting, we're trying to publicize more. We're trying to um, get people to write ad, um, articles. We had a small exhibition. Um, we're lending out objects. Um, it's just a, a little further along the line, just in, in our particular case. Um, it's something that uh, I have really got to tackle. <laughs> okay. Um, I had planned now that, that we would take a break so that people might have some tea. Uh, and so...
we do need to start at exactly kind of five o'clock, so people have about half an hour, <coughs> uh, when we move to the last talk of the day by A.L. Weitzman. Thanks very much. Thank you.